so last Friday, in your own small group, you looked at Activity 310. You assigned roles from the play Dyrus and Frank. And each one of you had a series of roles. You folks practiced speaking aloud in different instructions, different tones. So how is that activity of kind of rehearsing as if you were an actor or an actress really preparing you for your book discussion? Once you've got your purpose statement done, you can flip that bookmark over and you can catalog which concepts 310 helped you practice. For those 10 concepts, we practiced two of them. So 310 had you practice concept one of including an oral, oral reading so you're reading aloud. And you also practice concept seven of communicating with an audience and communicating with your group members. So again, 310 helped you practice concept one and seven. Once you've got all that good stuff down, you can put your bookmark away. And in your springboard, you can open up to page 194. And you can go ahead and just use those two learning targets. Today, we're really tackling that first target of you folks analyzing narrative and preparing talking points. And then tomorrow, you folks will deliver your talking points. All right? Now, there's two steps on page 194 that we'll focus in on. The first one is a really simple quick write. It's not something that you have to write a paragraph for. But Elijah, could you read the quick write prompt for us, please? How does the theme funny write in the dark connect to the subject and the whole Thanks. All right. Take about a minute. Give yourself maybe a couple of sentences. How a theme of finding light in the darkness. How we've actually covered it within between shades of gray, with clips that we've watched, with excerpts that we've read. about 30 more seconds to kind of wrap up your response. Doesn't need to be long. <laughs> Now, step two is actually your in question, so we're not going to rewrite our response there, but just a brief little talk about it. So, two questions that were kind of spread apart with the same idea. Why might it be a good idea for an author to choose to write about such a horrific point in history from the perspective of a child? Yes, sorry, Christian. Okay, so cruelty. There was no boundary, there was no age limit, there was no gender that was not discriminated and hurt. That's a good point. Okay. Um, from a children's perspective, I think that's like targeting 
okay, from a children's perspective, they see things differently. Life is good. It's lighthearted. It's great. There's nothing morose. There's nothing scary about it. Yeah, Jordan? Um, well, if an author doesn't experience something, they often have a limited point of view, and a lot of children had a limited point of view at the time. Good so point. They didn't really know what's going on. Really good point. The limited point of view that the kids had, the author was able to get some information and express that. Last thought. Um, kids seem to usually see things in more detail than adults do, especially when the adults know what's going on. Writing. Good point. Children can see things that adults don't see, so maybe there's more detail that could be brought into the story. All good stuff. All right, now the bottom half of page 194 where you see that chart, that step three, cross it off. We're not going to work with the springboard chart, and instead this is where our raw notebook is going to come into play. So once you've made that delightful scratch in the book, go ahead and take out your raw notebook. We're going to put this entry in with number 11. The entry is going to be two parts. Today we're going to focus on the first part. Tomorrow we'll tackle the second part. So we're just going to use today's date for this piece. And the title is The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. If you want to abbreviate pajamas to PJs, you're more than welcome to. That saves you some time. That's totally fine. All right. Now, the entry itself, we're going to go ahead and label the first step of this as part one. And I'm going to ask that you turn your uh, notebook horizontally. That way you get the most space for the chart that we're going to be developing. You want to use the front and back of a piece in your notebook. So if you need to skip around some room, you're more than welcome to do that. You're going to be making a chart that has three columns and four rows. And again, you want it to take up the entire space on that page. So this is what you're going to be copying down. That very top row, you can make it as thin as you want. It's only just to label the columns. It's rows two through four that you want to take up the majority of space. Okay, now the excerpt that you're going to be reading today you're going to have the option that you could choose to do it within your group, or we could do it as an entire class. I'll put that option out there, majority vote. But whether we do it as a group or whether you do it within your smaller groups, you folks are going to be taking multiple pauses in the story. You're obviously going to be taking three. There's something you have to do at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the excerpt. <laughs> And there's also some key idea and detail questions that you're going to want to answer, too. This chart's going to act as a resource for the conversation and the quiz that you're going to have tomorrow. So if you're super thorough, it might help you out. But some of you are able to just do really abbreviated notes, and it still works for you. So if you need to abbreviate more, you're more than welcome to do that. Now, the excerpt itself is about four pages in length. So it's not going to take us more than, say, 25 minutes to do it as an entire group. But if you do it in small groups, it may not take as much time. It might be quicker for you. So before I kind of talk you through how this chart is going to work, let's, let's do a little majority rule here. How many of you would prefer to do this just in the smaller groups, not whole class? Majority rule. Okay. You folks are going to be doing this in small groups. So let me explain to you how you're going to tackle this chart. First, what we're going to do is kind of break up the reading. So I'm going to have you take some notes in the actual uh, lines of the book. That way you know, okay, where do I need to pause? What stuff do I need to answer? All right. Now, on page 195, 
The one key idea and detail question I want you to answer, it's actually the second one. It starts with analyze the description and dialogue. So that's going to be the first key idea and detail that you read. And then I'm going to have you folks take a pause after line 13. That actually shows up on page 196. This is going to be your first big break in the reading. And once you're done there, you folks are going to tackle this chart, and you'll tackle the beginning row. Well. So what you have to do, and this is the screen that I'll keep up for you folks as a resource and as a guide. At each one of these stopping points of the reading, you're going to explain how that section of the excerpt showcased finding light in the darkness. So you'll give a quick little synopsis of why you think it fits, and then you're going to provide a quote word for word. Okay? So that's what you'll do at each one of those major stopping points. All right, going back to your text, on page 196, you folks are going to answer both of those key idea and detail questions. And then you're going to be taking a stopping point after line 37. So at line 37, you're going to take another major stopping point. You have a key idea and detail question there as well that you're going to answer. But after line 37, that's when you go back to the chart again. You're going to talk about how this middle section fits the theme. What quote could you use to provide that? And then you'll stop at the very end of the story, and that's when you'll return to the chart for the final time. So there's only four key idea and detail questions that I need you to use kind of as a guiding point, and then you want to tackle this chart itself. All right? So taking a look at our time, I'm going to set aside, let's say, about 15 minutes. I'll see where you folks are at at the 15-minute mark. If you need more time, I can give you more time. If it looks like you folks are done, then we'll kind of do a quick review of what that trail is about. Okay, any questions that you got for me? All right, the time is yours. Go for it. Let me know if you have any questions. All right, so let's do a bit of a recap here of what you're looking at. And it's just going to be, hey, let's touch each question for a moment. Let's see what you're considering in terms of time, that theme, finding light in the darkness, and each component of the story. If you missed anything, when you hear it in our conversation, you can just always copy it. It's not a big deal. So at the very beginning of the story, this idea that Shmuel had a watch, this object that meant something to him. Why exactly would a watch have any kind of significance or importance to Shmuel in his life? What do you think, Victoria? Um, it symbolizes his life before the Holocaust, and it shows how once they took that away, they took away like, his life. Okay, good point. Victoria said that the watch symbolized his life before the Holocaust. And once that was taken away, that one object, his life was fully being taken away as well. Yeah, no, um, elaborating on that, it was his connection to his father. Okay, good point. That watch was a connection that he had with his father, and once it was gone, the connection that he had with his dad was starting to dissipate as well. All right, and then you folks went ahead and you started working on that very beginning well in your chart. So in terms of that opening scene where we're meeting Shmuel and Bruno and they're having a discussion, what exactly may have fit into that theme of finding light in the darkness? What are you thinking, Christian? Because they were, because they were uh, recalling like life before the Holocaust. Okay, Christian said the idea of recalling life before the Holocaust, so recalling the good times, not what's currently happening. Anything different? Okay. Um, we said how in the past situation he so found the correct to get Okay, good point. In a bad situation, there's still a friendship that's starting. There's someone that can help you get through a bad time. All right, then you folks went on and you read the second portion, and we came across these two questions about the fury that Bruno has visiting his home, and then how Bruno is really kind of processing everything Shmuel's telling him. 
So what exactly do you think the theory was meant to be? Hello, oh, Santiago? Hitler. Hitler, why do you say Hitler? I read the book a long time ago and it was a Fuhrer. It was Bruno, but it was Fuhrer. Good point. So Hitler, his name's sake in German was he was the Fuhrer. So it's kind of like a kid having to slip up with saying a word. But the idea of something being a theory, something being furious, kind of works too. So you could see a child making a connection like that. How about the second part? Why do you think this boy, Bruno, is having such a hard time processing the realities that she is facing? Why might that be difficult? He's had a really privileged life, so he doesn't understand the hardships that Camille's going through. Good point. Bruno's got a really privileged lifestyle. His father is a Nazi, but his father is also being called upon by Hitler. So he's probably a well-to-do man, and he knows what's going on. Did you want to add to that, Josh? Okay, good point. So in Bruno's eyes, Schmiel's life is kind of unrealistic. It, it can't be real. All right, how about when you folks hit that middle component of the story? I'm going to skip the similarities and differences question, because that one's a pretty no-brainer for you folks. In that middle component of the story, where exactly could you pull that scene from how these boys are interacting with one another? Yeah. Okay, Bruno tries to cheer up Shmuel. He does what he can. Anything different? Can you all see him the same way? Yeah, different. Um, like, the lightness is their friendship that they receive. They meet. They were able to create, like, in the dark time. Okay, the idea of creating a new friendship in a dark time. Good stuff. All right, and then the last component, I can't recall if you folks had a question here. This one, no, I had you folks skip that question. That's right. That wasn't a big deal. Now, the very end of that story, Shmuel starts getting scared. He starts backing away. He doesn't exactly want to necessarily be connected with Bruno anymore. Where exactly could we find that scene reoccur in that last third of the story? Good point. Bruno's kind of this opening boy. Hey, you could come over and you could have some yeah, I'm sure I could find something, bread or chocolate, help you out. Anything else? No? Nobody else now? All right then. Now, these words, these ideas that you were kind of developing, this is going to be a bit of a springboard, ha, 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 off to your conversation that you're going to have tomorrow. But with the remaining time that we've got left, I want to kind of shift gears here. And instead of talking about that text, I actually want you to go back to your white reading packets. And when I was looking at them, it seems like some of you were falling behind in getting your peer responses tackled with each reading. So I'm going to suggest that you pull those packets out, take a look over them, see what peer response entries you can go ahead and grab today. If you want to as well, this is not a bad idea to also have another conversation with your group members. Where is everybody? Are you guys ready to go on Thursday when we turn everything in?